But tonight, we're going to focus on this one right here. In fact, I think I'm going to go ahead. I wasn't going to do this. Remission possible, cancer risk reduction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start presenting this tonight. We're going to go into the immune system tomorrow, and we're going to actually finish this whole series. Because I've had so many people come up to me and talk to me about cancer here. We need the answer for cancer, brothers and sisters, and Jesus wants to give that to us. All right, He's given us principles whereby I believe this can occur. So we're going to be looking at that tonight. Remission possible. We're going to go into the first, um, the first presentation. This is actually a three-part series. It's going to have to be a bridge somewhat, but I'm going to try to get to all the important points. And um, if you have any questions at the end, Feel free to stick around. <clears throat> I had a number of other people that requested me. Just go ahead and give your meeting. Don't make it a Q&A session. So Amen. if that's okay with everyone here, if that's a consensus, that's what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace towards us. We thank you that you are so patient with us. And we see how... Um, Men in our past history and relating to the uh, most important messages that you have given to humanity that we have uh, we've kind of squandered uh, opportunities to make good on these messages. But we pray that you would please forgive us as well, for we have squandered time. We have uh, had messages that are uh, greatly to be valued and cherished and promulgated that we have kind of neglected to receive and to give. And so I pray you would be with us tonight, that you would truly fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit. You would give us wisdom and understanding to know how you want to bring glory and honor to your name through the healing of our bodies, of our minds, and of our characters. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So I have to um, just give you a little intro here. This is more of a Bible study than a health lecture, okay? Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. All right, but I'm telling you, this is unlike any other Bible study you probably have ever experienced because it really does show that cancer has a divine remedy. Let me just tell you a little story before we get started. This story has to do with something you're seeing over here. Now let's, let's check for a minute. 
Yes, it's appearing right there. What is that? It's the ocean. Anyone like to go to the ocean? You know, I used to, I grew up with this desire every summer. Um, I can't remember any summer that our family did not do this. We went and rented a beach house for one week and all the family got together. It was kind of like one of those get together weeks, right? All the cousins got together and um, I had the privilege of getting together with my best friend, my cousin Timothy. And I'll tell you, we grew up together. And I don't have all the time to share with you how deep our friendship was, but we could be apart. We didn't have cell phones and texting and all those things back then. Uh, so we couldn't keep tabs on each other when we were apart. But I'll tell you, when we got back together, we, we might not have seen each other for months, but within a couple minutes, it was like we had been together. We had never left. Okay, you ever, ever had friends like that? Amen. So I, I'm telling you, I... I, I, okay, I can't jump ahead of myself, but we had a tremendous friendship. One of the last, um, most, uh, I guess, uh, strong memories I have and pleasant memories I have of spending time with my cousin Timothy was actually uh, when we were just finished with high school. Uh, just graduated from high school, and that summer we went to the beach. And uh, my cousin had, he had signed up for the Marines. He was going to be shipped off to Japan or something. I can't remember where he went first, but I was going to school. And so we knew we were going to definitely part ways in a big way. Um, but we went for this walk on the beach and we both were into health at that time. Uh, and uh, we went for a run actually. And I can remember running through the sand in just the full blaze of the vigor of youth. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Don't squander it. If you're under the age of 20, don't squander the, that precious gift that God has given you. Okay, I can still do it, but I'll suffer the next day. <laughs> All right, I have some gray hairs to prove I'm not as young as I look. Um, and so we were running through this, uh, just kind of chasing these. Well, actually, we saw this big flock of seagulls up ahead of us, and we were just racing ahead, uh, full stride, and the seagulls flew off, and it was like as if they were encircling us. The, the sun, I mean, it looked even more beautiful than this, I think. It was just amazing. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. This is awesome. It can't get much better than this. I'm with my best friend, where, I mean, we even jumped into the riptides and tried our strength thing. I mean, it sounds kind of crazy. Don't do it. But it was just this camaraderie that we had, okay? And then, before we knew it, the vacation was over, and my cousin was, I don't know how, six, 10,000, I don't know how many thousands of miles away, but definitely beyond my realm of contact. And so, I went to school, he went to the Marines, and uh, that was all we kind of knew of each other for a while. But then I got a call about, I think this was about a year and a half later, from my mom. And she said, Timothy has cancer. In fact, Timothy has a very dangerous form of cancer in his brain. And um, I didn't really know what to think because I'd never really been confronted with this disease before in one of my family members. And so I guess I kind of took it lightly, but um, we actually went down to see um, Timothy. He had been flown over to um, California, had a first operation there, and the first time I saw him was during his sec right after his second operation in a hospital in North Carolina. And by this time, this Marine who had excelled in all of his PT drills. He was at the top of all of his PT drills. And you know, Marines are pretty big, right? He was already emaciated. His radiation had burned his skin off of his, the, the sides of his uh, skull. He was suffering and he was bewildered because the operation had affected his brain. And I thought to myself, how unfair, how unfair. Uh, I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about Timothy as we close, what happened to him. 
But you know, I'm, I'm not alone. There are a lot of people that are suffering from cancer. There are a lot of people who are having their family members coming down with this dread diagnosis. Now, we know that some forms of cancer are not as deadly as others. But no one wants to get this diagnosis, whatever form of cancer it is. There's a lot of questions about cancer. And uh, I don't know if any of you know, but I was actually privileged to work at UT Pines for four and a half years as a director of the lifestyle training program. And one of my responsibilities was teaching the young people that came in how to understand, I, I taught pathophysiology, how to understand diseases. And so the time came for me to teach about cancer. And I looked at all my notes. I looked at uh, Dr. Agatha Thrash's notes and I was just confused. I looked at everything I could find on the internet. And by the way, <laughs> if you're searching for answers only using the internet, you're going to become confused and bewildered. We need biblical principle. And I'm very thankful that it's expounded upon in the spirit of prophecy. So none need air therein. Amen? But you know what? I was getting confused. And so I went to my mentor, Dr. Agatha Thrash, and I said, Dr. Agatha, I don't understand this. Where does cancer come from? I can't find the source. There's all these conflicting theories. And she said, you know what, Ron? We don't know where it comes from. There's a lot we don't know about cancer. You know, Sister White says cancer is a virus. And we've actually linked up uh, retroviruses that come in and insert and mutate DNA that, yeah, they do cause cancer. But I think there's even more to that than we understand. Because we don't understand cancer. Believe it or not, we don't understand it. We treat it, but we don't understand it. That understanding is growing, but tonight, I believe you will understand cancer better than 99.9% .9 of all the oncologists in this world today. You know why? Because you're going to understand cancer from a biblical perspective. Okay, are you ready for this? All right, we're going to have these questions answered before our very eyes. We looked at this graph the other night. Cancer, we know, is the second leading cause of death among U.S. adults, but that is uh, increasing tremendously. In fact, it is projected that cancer will soon take the preeminence in being the number one killer among U.S. adults. And we don't see any end in sight. This is very, very dangerous, a very dangerous disease. So how can we find out more about this disease? God tells us in Hosea 4, 6, my people are what? Destroyed. Destroyed for lack of knowledge. What knowledge is this? Is it knowledge that we only find on the internet? And I'm not decrying the use of the internet. I use it all the time. But we have to be principled in how we seek out that knowledge, right? This is knowledge from God, knowledge of the Most High, knowledge of His commandments, knowledge of His will. This is how we can be preserved from destruction. Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. We also have the prophetic insight, right? Believe the prophets and you'll prosper. So there is an injunction to seek out among the hundreds of thousands of pages of manuscript and writing, published writings of Ellen G. White, to search those scriptures as well, to search those inspired writings. Amen? Amen? None need air therein. Because if we're left up into ourselves, we're going to choose the wrong remedies at the wrong time, whether they be physical, mental, or spiritual. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the what? Ways, Ways of death. So, that is a very profound statement. How does that tie into cancer? How does it tie into cancer? Well, let's first look at one different, actually, let's look at one type of cancer, and we will find that very answer. Melanoma, the dread skin cancer. Now, we, we have squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma. Those are slow growing. No one really seems to be con too concerned with those. But if you get the diagnosis of melanoma, that is dangerous, very dangerous. In fact, that strikes fear in the hearts of most people, more so than uh, any other type of skin cancer and for the most part, any other type of cancer because it's quick to metastasize. 
Where does melanoma develop? In the melanocytes. Are melanocytes important? What do they do? I can tell you by looking at many of you out here, especially the ones who have been out here building the cabin or the ones that went down there by the lake today or the river, you, your melanocytes were hard at work. You know why? Because what they do is they help to protect your body from solar radiation, which can be pretty harmful. It can actually cause, well, in overabundance and excess, it can cause cancer, right? Now, in moderation, it actually is a protective element against cancer. So don't shy away from cancer, but don't try to get all reddened and peeling and blistered and burnt. That's where that's, that, that concept of temperance comes in, right? Where we moderately use that which is good. And Solomon said, surely the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. So solar radiation can be a benefit because it does produce vitamin D in our bodies and it helps to produce serotonin in the brain and uh, in turn turns into melatonin. We get the good night, he, uh, uh, a good night's worth of healing sleep. So it's important, but God has placed those things with a specific purpose of duty. There are kind of like the front line of defense against that potentially dangerous element, the UVB radiation. Now, if they decide somehow they're not going to do that, they can be a detrimental element in the body. In fact, any element in the universe that decides it's not going to follow God's commands and God's dictates and God's instructions becomes a destructive element. Do you know that? Because unless it's following the eternal rules of rectitude, of right, it's following the wrong. Everyone with me on that? There's only two directions to go. God's way or the wrong way, right? And so when these melanocytes come in contact with things like this right here, does anyone know what this is? Smog. You know what the primary component of smog is? It's not CO2, okay? It's actually sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide. It's caused by the burning of fuel, and it's very dangerous. It's dangerous to the environment. It's dangerous to the health. And uh, for instance, they found a direct linkage between sulfur dioxide in the air and the prevalence of malignant melanoma. Why? Because it actually goes into something we call the DNA and the genetic instructions that particularly apply to the melanocytes, which should be good productive cells, right? And helpful cells. It goes in there and it causes a change, an abrogation to God's instructions that are found in the DNA. And it tells that cell, do something else. Live a different way. Okay? That sounds like the same that's in the physical is in the spiritual, right? That's an interesting connection there. And you know what? When I first saw this, I thought, you know, this warrants further investigation. And I, I brought this to Dr. Thrash and I said, you know what? It seems as though cancer is caused by a violation of that genetic instruction or an abrogation change of that genetic instruction found there in the DNA. So that's exactly right. We don't know exactly what causes that, but that's what happens. So where does cancer come from? It comes from within us, okay? Due to some sort of maybe outside element, maybe a carcinogen, a cancer-generating substance, whatever it may be, mutation. We'll get into all that in another uh, lecture. But suffice it to say, it's a change of the laws. Though they may appear small, they're so small that we can't even read it with bifocals or microfilm or through a microfilm reader. They're so small, yet nonetheless, God placed them there. We're told that God's law is written upon every muscle, upon every fiber of our being. You know that? And when we live in cooperation with God's law on the exterior, the interior is provided for. You know that? It's an amazing, harmonious um, coexistence that we can survive, that we can thrive in when we follow God's commandments. So, there's an interesting similarity 
between the physical and the spiritual. Now, I must say this. I must say this. I don't want any, if anyone's sleeping, nudge them because I don't want them to wake up and consider this all to be blasphemy, okay? <laughs> nudge them. <laughs> all right, everyone, please open your ears to hear this. I am not saying that cancer is sin or sin is cancer, all right? I didn't say that. But what did I say? There's a similarity in the definition, right? Because the definition of sin is what? The transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, right? Sin is a transgression of the law, right? Now, on the internal side of things, if God commanded the, in the DNA that the melanocyte was to produce melanin in, um, when UVB radiation came in, it was to allow that melanin to darken when the UVA radiation came in to protect the body from damage. God wanted that process to stay in place, right? He put it there for a reason, to protect us, so that we can enjoy going outside and rejoicing as Solomon rejoiced that, yes, the light is sweet, amen? Because that's a biblical principle right there. We're to be in harmony with biblical principles. And so God made a method in which, whereby uh, when he created us, when he formed us, whereby we could actually live in harmony with his laws because there are even laws that he has given, maybe not for us to carry out. I'm glad I don't have to produce melanin. That's my melanocyte's duty, right? Right? That's an amazing thing. But when the melanocyte transgresses, there comes about the abrogation brings in what? Cancer, potentially. If it's a mutation tending towards cancer. We'll figure out how that happens in just a minute. But at the same time, we know that sin is a transgression of the law. So there's a similarity there, okay? Not going beyond that in terms of the definition of cancer, all right, and the definition of sin. But let's take this a step further. If there's a similarity in the definition with cancer and the definition of sin, could it be possible that if we look at the progression of sin in the Word of God, that we could find the answer that oncologists and pathophysiologists are looking for in terms of how cancer actually progresses. Do you think it's possible? Not only is it possible, if you can stay awake for the next half an hour, you are going to realize this is an amazing insight that God has given to us as a people. And it's right here in His Word. Okay? So, here it is, right here. This is our Bible study. Question. Number one, how does cancer progress? Question number two is how we were gonna, or we're gonna actually answer this question, how does sin progress? Okay, we're ready for this? Let's turn to Proverbs 6, 16. Proverbs 6, 16. And uh, keep your thumb here because we're gonna be using this verse quite frequently. And by the way, oncologists have figured this out in, to some extent. We, we can piecemeal the research papers together and we can see, yeah, they figured it out, but they don't have any more knowledge other than that. But you know, we not only can figure out how it progresses, but we know the solution as well. Because we know the solution for sin, amen? amen? And I'll submit to you, there's also a solution for cancer that's biblical. Okay? So, let's go here. Proverbs 6, 16. Six things doth the Lord hate. Does God hate sin? Most definitely. But remember, He loves you and I. Proverbs 6, 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto Him. What's an abomination? It's the worst hatred, right? It's, it's utterly detestable to God. All right? What is it that God hates? Number one, in verse 17, a proud look. Two, a lying tongue. Three hands that shed innocent blood. This sounds like the Minneapolis uh, can, uh, conference, right? God hates it. And it, actually, it really does sound like, as we go on, you're going to see how much this sounds like it. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and listen to this, he that soweth discord among brethren. That's the thing that he utterly hates. He utterly detests. It's an abomination to God. For, for someone to sow discord among brethren. Have mercy. Okay, so, that being said, I believe that this is a lineage 
of the fall uh, and transgression and eventual eviction from heaven of Lucifer. Okay? I do believe and I think that we have enough biblical evidence to support that. But it also can show a, tra a, a trail of progress in sin in our own lives. Okay? So let's go to step one and let's take a look at how this can occur. First, we'll go to the issue of sin. How did sin occur? We don't know exactly, do we? We're told that it's a mystery how it developed in Lucifer because God made Lucifer what? Perfect. He was perfect in all his ways, right? In uh, Ezekiel 28, 15, from the day he was created till iniquity was found in, well, in thee, in, that, uh, um, in him or in thee. So, he was created perfect, but what did he start to cherish in his heart? Pride. Pride, right? And this pride, pride is deadly, isn't it? Because unless pride is repented of, we're going to go onward in transgression. You know that? And that's exactly what happened to Lucifer. He was confronted, we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets, the origin of evil, that he was confronted by the heavenly angels, wasn't he? But did he give in? For a time, maybe, it appeared as though he gave in. He said, yeah, God is, uh, he has, actually is loving. He cares about us. But he continued to cherish that pride, especially when he saw Christ exalted, right? He just couldn't take it. He wanted to be like the Most High. He cherished that pride in his heart, and he continued on in the path of transgression. That's step one in the progress of sin. Everyone see that? Make sense? How does this relate to cancer? Take a look at this. God has created these wonderful organelles, the different components of the, of the cell, with specific functions. It's said that the complexity of one single human cell is greater in terms of all its, its uh, processes, its enzymatic actions. Its, uh, I mean, it's just amazing the amount of processes that are going on here. They're more complicated than New York at rush hour. Can you imagine that? That's not even just Times Square. That's the whole of New York, okay? Can you imagine all the transactions that are going on there? I'm thankful that I don't have to manage all those things, all right? I don't have to be the mayor of one of those cities, okay? I'm very thankful that God has placed law and order in place so that those things, by His hand, by His guidance, we're told that if it were not for the action of the Holy Spirit, the pulse would not beat, okay? The, the brain would not act its part. So we can be thankful that it's God that gives us life and sustains us too. But He also puts laws into our body and instruction into our cells that He means to be followed. Now, when an abrogation or a change is made to that genetic instruction, by the way, DNA, what is it? It's kind of like this. You have been given a book. Your mother and your father gave you your father gave you one half, your mother gave you your other half, and it got all shuffled up. So you're not one side of your mom, one side of your dad. Okay? But you know what that book is filled with? Instructions. It's an instruction manual. You can't read it, but your cells can. There are certain uh, cells that can read certain passages. You know, I talked about stem cells, right? The neat thing about stem cells is they've got almost an open book. They can be anything that they need to be. But as a cell becomes more specialized... Um, it has a more specific duty. You know the neat thing, of, well not neat thing, but interesting thing about cancer? The more it develops in transgression, the less specialized it becomes. The less it wants to actually follow specific directions God has given it. Isn't that interesting? Okay, how does this cancer though display the proud look? Well, if a mutation is found in this cell right here, Let's say it's starting to, there are two things that can happen. It's starting to actually replicate itself, which is a normal cellular process in most cells. It's replicating itself. It's transmitting. Uh, the DNA is coming up and, and being uh, copied. And there is a checks and balances system whereby the DNA is double checked, right? Anyone ever heard of the Waldensians? Okay, they had to hand write out all their Bibles, right? And they had to check page versus page, right? To see that everything was correct. Now, if something's not correct, woe be to the one who was writing it, right? They've got to get rid of it. 
okay? It's the same exact thing that happens in the cell. If the cell is found to have genetic uh, misinformation, you know what happens? Something is triggered that's called apoptosis, programmed cellular death. It self-destructs. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Who's thankful for that? You know, apoptosis is going on all the time in your cells. And I'm thankful for that because if it didn't, well, just consider this. Let's say the cell is dividing and it just decides for some reason it's not going to have this apoptosis going on. Okay? Or another step, we could say, it finds that it is not working in cooperation or in harmony. Let's say there was a, a, a mutation that was transferred from the genetics, right? And that genetic change became active, or that genetic became, the genes became active during a certain portion of the life. It, they can be born with the activity, or they could have that active uh, dur transpiring during their own life. We'll talk about that tomorrow in more detail when we explain the epigenome. But suffice it to say, when the cell knows it's doing wrong, it usually self-destructs, okay? Brothers and sisters, I wish Lucifer had self-destructed, and not necessarily blown himself up, but died to self, because that's the solution to sin, okay? When we find ourselves in transgression, when we're reading the law of God, by the way, we're understanding God's will. When we find something that, oh, I'm not doing this, we have a choice to make. What is that choice? We can either continue on and say, oh, I don't care anymore. That's just a little admonition. I'm not going to follow that. What's that called? Pride, a proud look. Okay? We don't commit spiritual apoptosis, right? And we go on in transgression. Isn't that interesting? Does everyone see uh, the same that's in the spiritual is in the physical in this case? Everyone see that? Okay, then we can move on to step two. A lying tongue. How does this lying tongue work? Well, what did Lucifer do when he left the presence of God? Did he go out and speak the truth? No. no he was the first liar, right? The father of what? Lies. Okay? So we already know he had a lying tongue. That was a set after pride came the lies. Um, and we'll find that in our own lives as well. We'll lie to ourselves. We'll lie to our spouses. We'll lie to our, our fellow uh, church members if we continue on in transgression. You know that to be the case, right? Because pride breeds deception. But in this case, in the cell's case, it's the same, uh, same apparent happening. This is why. Because when a cancer is fully established, the, the, the abrogation of the law is fully established, and we have the self following out some of the dictates of its own free will, so to speak, and it's not doing something good, by the way, not doing something it was supposed to do, not something that was directed to do by God, it has a problem. You know what that problem is? The monitoring of the immune system. Because we have a system whereby Things are cells that are not in harmony with the genetic instructions are destroyed. Okay? So let's say uh, we have a um, T cell, T lymphocyte. We'll learn more about that on Friday when we go over the immune system again. T lymphocyte comes around. Actually, you know what? We might even just bring it together and talk about it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. But suffice it to say, T lymphocytes will be on the lookout for these cells that are not doing the right thing, along with viral infected cells and bacteria, whatever may be the threat. And so when something happens in the body whereby an alert is raised, there's a chemical that's released called interferon. What interferon does is it sends a signal to the immune system and to the cells in that region. Could be systemic, but usually it's a regional um, relay of this chemical. What does it say? It says, okay, cells, the immune system is going to perform an inspection. We want everyone to uh, raise these proteins on their outer surface. They're called made, uh, uh, MHC for short, histocompatibility complex. And these proteins are placed on the outer surface. And the proteins say, hi, I am a melanocyte, and this is what I do for a living, and the, here's my, all my 
regulations and my, uh, my instructions, and yeah, I'm following my instructions, and the immune cell comes over and says, hey, uh, melanocyte, you're, yeah, yeah, I see you're doing the right thing. Uh, thank you, have a nice day. And they go on their way and they, they go to the next cell, okay? Now, let's say there's a malignant melanoma over here. That's bad news for malignant melanoma, isn't it? And so that immune cell goes over there, and you know what happens? It doesn't find MHC. Why? It doesn't find the proteins that say, hi, I'm malignant melanoma. I'm causing chaos in the body. I'm not following the law that God gave me to follow, the instruction God gave me to follow. It's not finding that. You know why? Because for some strange reason, that cell knows that if it puts this out, it's going to be destroyed. So what does it do? It hides it. It says, I'm not telling you anything. And you know what? You don't even have the right to destroy me. And it's true. Killer T cells, they may sound deadly, but they don't have the right to destroy a cell that's not displaying its MHC. Okay? Aren't you glad, though, that God has not left us comfortless? Here comes along a natural killer cell. And he talks to this uh, killer T cell. He says, hey, this guy's not telling me anything. And this killer T cell says, don't worry. God has given me instruction that I need to go now and sniff him out, investigate him a little bit. And if I find out he's doing something wrong, MHC or not, he's going to be destroyed because of his deception. What a blessing, right? Amen. What a blessing. You know, by lifestyle choices, we can actually kill those natural killer cells. They're called the tumor surveillance system, and we can wipe them out. So what do you think happens? Those cancer cells say, I'm not telling anybody, and there's not even any natural killer cells out here to make me do anything otherwise. So the immune system is paralyzed by the choices that we make. But let's get back to this cell, okay? Is it displaying a lying tongue? Yes. It's being deceitful, right? It's lying to the body and to the cells around it. Okay, that's quite interesting that we see that, uh, and I don't believe that's a coincidence, we've seen already two out of two fit the, um, uh, the, the cancer definition, the cancer progression, and the sin definition, sin progression, up to step two. We see it all matches up, right? I'm not making this up, okay? So let's go now to step three. Step three, hands that shed innocent blood. What was Lucifer's desire towards Christ? Was it benevolent? No. He displayed his full desire towards Christ even before, uh, barely before Christ, or, or bar barely after Christ came out of the womb, right? What did he want to do to Christ? Kill him, get him out of the way. He hated Christ, right? He wanted to be like the Most High, not Christ. And so if there were ever hands that shed innocent blood, they were the premeditated murders, or premeditation of murder. He hated his brother without cause in heaven. There originally, and then carried out all throughout Satan's existence up until this present day. Hands that shed innocent blood. And we've seen what happens when people follow the dictates of Satan. They kill innocent people as well. Right? So does that make sense? In the progression of sin, in the progression that Satan had? He would have murdered Christ if he could have there in heaven. We know that because of what he tried to do there. He was a murderer from the beginning as well. Okay, hands that shed innocent blood. Well, how does this relate to or does it relate to the growth of this cancer? It's quite interesting that when cancer occurs in the body, it's usually an isolated set of cells that are doing this. Okay, so like, let's say the malignant melanoma. That's the melanocytes. There are other cells that are around it that are innocent. They're not doing anything wrong. But when you have overgrowth of tissues in the body, there are two, thing, two things that can happen. Two things. And two reasons why innocent blood can be shed. This is the first one right here. Because the cancer cell starts to grow, replicate, 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 and you have a growth there that's abnormal. Usually when we palpate around a tumor, what do we find? It's larger than the other areas of tissue, right? Why is that? Because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. It's another step. But it grows. It multiplies. It usually grows pretty fast. It usually grows faster than the surrounding tissues. 
This poses a problem to many tissues that are in compartments. And most of our tissues are in compartments. Some are more flexible than others, um, such as the tissues in the abdominal cavity. There are not any bones to obstruct the growth of the abdominal cavity. But if you get them in the brain, there's really not a whole lot of room to move in the brain, okay? That's why even benign, slow-growing brain tumors can be deadly. But when you have cells that are compressed in their compartment, what does compression do? If someone's bleeding to death and you apply compression, what are you doing? Stopping the blood flow. If you stop the blood flow for too long, what happens? Death. Okay, there are areas of necrotic tissue surrounding the tumor. And it's not necessarily because the tumor is dying off. It's because of the innocent cells around it that are being suffocated to death, that are being constricted, strangulated to death because of the compartment uh, syndrome effects of this growing tumor. Okay, they're innocent, right? But the blood is being shed there by this tumor, hands that shed innocent blood. And by the way, cancer has these hands. They grow out like tentacles many times. Okay, how else does this happen? Well, sooner or later, the tumor is going to become so large that it's going to have a voice in the body. Now, this is actually quite interesting parallel to the body of Christ. We won't get into exactly how and just uh, right now, but um, you can probably put two and two together. If you have a cancerous growth, and it starts to get large enough to be hormonally active, which doesn't take a whole lot. Every organ in the body, every tissue group in the body communicates via hormones, okay? And what happens here is the tumor becomes, in its own mind, an organ, okay? And it actually sends out a chemical called angiogenin, which is a request for a blood supply to be routed to it. It says, I'm important over here. I need help. I need to be established firmly. I'm being treated unfairly over here, by the way. <laughs> I need a blood supply so that I can continue to grow and provide for the needs of the body, right? And so you know what happens sometimes? Now, sometimes the body puts a check on this, and there are natural remedies that can actually check this in and of themselves. But the blood supply comes to that tumor, and it usually consumes a huge amount an inordinate amount of this blood, okay? And then the growth takes off because the life is in the blood. Now you've got life being given to this tumor. How does that affect and hamper the life of the innocent cells, though, in other parts of the body? Well, this is an important consideration to remember. We only have about four to five liters of blood in the body, okay? Pregnant women have an extra liter because they need also some for the fetal circulation at all times. But we have a problem with that number. You might think, well, that's a lot of blood. It's really not. Considering the fact that we have 60,000 miles of capillaries, and this is where the, the blood is actually um, doing its real purpose in providing nutrients, taking uh, carbon dioxide, and giving oxygen to those tissues. It's, it's really doing its job at the capillaries. This is the problem, though. If you open up the channels of all the 60,000 miles of capillaries, you know how much volume they can hold? Five liters. So there's no blood in the heart. There's no blood in the veins. There's no blood in the arteries. You go into, uh, you go into shock and you die. And that doesn't sound like a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, God has instituted a system whereby in due season every part of the body is to receive a proper circulation. You've heard the term proper circulation equals proper health. Yes. This is why it's so important for us to exercise because if we're not, we're not feeding adequately the, the tissues that are there in the legs and the arms and the extremities. Why is that? Because the, the stomach is probably calling for blood when we're having our meals, but are the legs calling for blood? Not if, if they're not being used, they won't call for blood. So we have a part to play in this proper circulation. And so when the digestive capillaries are shut down, when we don't need to digest our food, we can open up these capillaries over here. Anyone ever tried to swim right after a meal? 
What happens? The stomach complains, doesn't it? You have cramping. Why? Because the capillaries are open and it's saying, hey, someone robbed me of my blood supply. I'm going to complain. I need the blood right now. I'm going to tell this person up here to stop doing that strenuous activity so that I can actually digest and give him the nutrients he needs or she needs. Okay? Why is that? Because I, as I said before, there is a time in which blood is given to every part, every capillary bed in the body. Now, since there's a scarcity of blood, imagine you've got a newcomer coming in saying, I need blood all the time. I don't care about the brain. I don't care about the other organs. I don't care about the skin. I don't care about the joints or the tissue supporting the joints. What happens? Tissues start to starve and die off. Hands that shed innocent blood. In two ways, it's got two hands that shed innocent blood. Either by compression or by restriction of blood flow through taking something that's not even rightfully belonging to it. Everyone see that? Okay, so this is pretty interesting, isn't it? We're already on step three. I'm going to try to get through this quickly because it's also important for us to get a good night's sleep. Okay? All right, so hands that shed innocent blood. We've seen this happen. There's the little diagram showing the bloodstream being established. Now, this presents a problem right here. Did I just skip ahead? Okay. Well, that's, okay, so we're on the right section here. All right. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. How does this come into play with Satan? What did he say? Isaiah 14, 14. Well, actually, let's step back to verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You know what the high priest would do? Rip his... You know, <laughs> he wasn't supposed to do that, but that's blasphemy, isn't it? It's a wicked imagination. If there ever was a wicked imagination. And so here we have Satan showing his true imaginings of his heart, and they are indeed wicked beyond all comprehension. But, it's, but how does this relate... And by the way, we can do this too. If we continue on in the path of transgression, we're going to start to have wicked imaginations also. Okay? How does this relate to cancer? This is quite interesting. <clears throat> there is a naturally imposed limit on the amount of times that a cell can replicate. Okay, we saw that replication kind of showed over here. And when a cell replicates, it divides from one cell into two, and then if you can imagine, I can't draw a pyramid with my hands, but you have one, uh, one going to two, and then two going to what? Four, and then we have this growth, this tremendous growth. But God has placed a limit in most human cells that it stops after 48 replications. It just stops. It's a protective mechanism. Uh, the scientists will call it the Hayflick limit. I guess Dr. Hayflick uh, first identified it. But you know what the cancer cell says? It says, I don't care about Dr. Hayflick. I don't care about the Hayflick limit. I am going to continue to replicate as long as I can. And it will continue on forever indefinitely. You know what? These, uh, it's not going to con continue on forever. It just thinks it can. These cancer cells in the medical research, when they get to this point, are called immortalized cancer cells. They believe the lie that Satan said, thou shalt surely not die. Okay? They have cast off all restraint and they think they're going to live forever. And uh, by the way, they have one goal in mind. You know what that goal is? To become the body. To become the body. Now, usually, we have cells in our body that are happy to be co-laborers with their brethren in the body, right? They're happy to help build up and strengthen and nourish the other organs, and even if it means being deprived of something, right? But not cancer. Cancer doesn't care about the other organs and tissues. It just wants to grow and grow and grow, and eventually it wants to take over. But you know what? That can't happen because the body will die. Okay, we know that. That's the end result of cancer. 
And that's the end result of the sin problem. I'm very thankful that God intervened. Otherwise, you know, Satan th thought his kingdom would go on forever. We're already seeing the earth basically being self-destructed, right? I'm glad that Christ is coming soon to take us home. So I would say that that is a wicked imagination in that cell's mind. Wouldn't you say that? Okay, to become the body. All right. Isn't this interesting? Who thinks this is interesting? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. We still have some people awake. <laughs> All right, I will try to move through this quickly. We're almost, we're almost there. All right, feed the be swift and running to mischief. When these blood supplies established here to the um, tumor, something strange starts to happen. And that is that these cells, these cancer cells, will oftentimes slip through this vessel wall and they'll run away. They'll run away from home. They actually don't really care about their home site. They actually want to go to another place and start everything all over again and say, I want to be like the body here. And I'm going to establish my colony here. And that's called what? Metastasis, right? Now we know that Lucifer was swift in running to mischief, right? He, he dissuaded, or he, uh, not dissuaded, he deceived an, a large host, right? More than half the angels were told were originally deceived by Satan, right? Until Christ presented, no, this is, you know, I love you, you know, this is not where you need to go. And then only one third was deceived. But still, that took a lot of swiftness on the part of Lucifer, right? His feet, his wings, whatever he used were swift in running to mischief. And it's the same exact thing with this cancer. Now, this is not the only way that um, the cancer can spread, the metastasis can occur. I told you about the compartment syndrome occurring, right? Where we have the cells that are growing very rapidly. We have a compartment right here that's called the basement membrane. And it, when the cells start to replicate at such a high level, they will burst out of that compartment. And you know, cancer cells are very, very dangerous to handle. You know why? Anyone ever opened a bag of beans? Okay. What happens? You got to be careful because if you're not, they'll go everywhere. Do they stick together? No. Now imagine you have a bowl of sticky rice or a bag of sticky rice. You open it, hey, what's going to happen? Maybe plop on the floor right in front of you, right? If you're not careful, but for the most part, they're going to stick together. Cancer cells, because they do not show surface proteins, they're not showing this MHC, they're slippery. They lack cohesive unity. And you can see it, they're not in orderly fashion over here either. And so when the basement membrane opens up, or even a surgeon's scalpel opens up the tumor, this is why they have to take a wide margin of healthy tissue around to try to make sure that they've got all the cancer and that they don't cut open the tumor and you get seeding all over the body. Why? Because they're, they, don't, they really don't like each other, not cohesive. They don't, they're not of one accord. They're of one accord in evil, but they don't really like each other. Same with Satan and his angels, right? They're of one accord in, with evil, but they don't really like each other. Okay, there's no love there. All right, very interesting, isn't it? Feet to be swift and running to mischief. All right, everyone see that? And they set up their own little um, colonies. Metastasis occurs. Okay, step six. A false witness that speaketh lies. How does this happen? A false witness that speaketh lies. We already learned that the, cell, the cancer cell itself was deceptive, right? Well, when the cancer gets to be a certain size, it also tries to deceive the body. You know what its first target is? There are two targets. One target is a cell in the immune system known as the regulatory T cell. You know what it says to that regulatory T cell? It sends out hormones. They're called tumor-derived soluble factors. Sends them out. Says, hey, Regulatory T cell, we know that you're the guy who calls the retreat and tells the immune system there's no battle to fight. So we want to tell you, we've got a message for you. And what this message says is, we're not an enemy over here. We're being mistreated. And we don't deserve this kind of treatment. So tell the immune system to stop fighting us. And you know what happens? If that is in, uninterrupted by other processes, that regulatory T cell set comes over and says, you know what, immune system, T cells, B cells, macrophage, whatever, stop fighting this nice guy over here. He's our friend. 
What does that look like? A false witness that speaketh lies. Lucifer did the very same thing. He went around, we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets, the origin of evil. He would insinuate doubts in the uh, minds of the angels. And then they would become false witnesses that would speak his very lies that he wanted them to speak. Okay? You see how that happens? Do you see the connection here? Isn't this amazing? Okay? Is it enough to wake everyone up for a few more minutes? <laughs> All right, good, good. All right, now another thing that happens, this is very, very scary, okay? And that is that these same hormones, the same tumor-derived soluble factors, they go out and they seek out immature macrophages or monocytes, okay? Myeloid cells. And it says to these cells, now these cells don't know much. They're not really... They're not versed in combat, I guess you could say. And it says to them, hey, we want you to come over here and fight for us because we're being mistreated here and you need to become our defense. And you know what happens? If, if nothing intervenes, these macrophages come over. And I'll tell you, they may look small when they're, when they're little, but when they get big, they're the biggest bullies of the immune system. Okay. I mean, they're like tanks compared with the other, like a neutrophil is like this size on their microscope, macrophage is like this size, okay? And now the tumor has macrophages guarding it, saying, immune system, you're not coming over here. This is our friend. That's terrible, isn't it? It's terrible. False witness that speaketh lies. And this leads to our second step, or our seventh step here. He that soweth discord among brethren. We already see the beginnings of that with these monocytes, these macrophages that are actually fighting now the body. But it doesn't stop here. There's something even more sinister at work. And let's go first to the war in heaven. Why was there war in heaven? Because there came a time in which God's forbearance with Lucifer had been exhausted. Because Lucifer thought, now I should take the kingdom by force, right? And so God had to stand up and say, you could come no further than this. And he took Satan. There was war in heaven. And Satan and his angels were cast out. Okay? Why? Because of that discord that Satan had sown. War, right? Discord. We think of discord, that's like strife, right? And war and fighting. It's not harmony. Can you believe it? There was disharmony in heaven that doesn't sound right, does it? And it wasn't right. And that's why Satan had to be cast out. Now, how does this come into play in the body? How does this relate to cancer? This is quite interesting. When we have these normal cells, and I told you that there was an area of necrotic tissue, of dead tissue around these cells. Remember that? Uh, he that um, shed innocent blood. Remember this? Okay, we've got this area of necrotic tissue around. Now, you know what God is going to send in? We learned this the other day. When, God, when we read the create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, what does God send in to the uh, heart attack victim to clean out their heart? Macrophages, right? Because part of their job is to clean up dead tissue. And, and the area of, of dead tissue surrounding the tumor is no different. There will be macrophages, not the ones that are guarding the tumor, but the ones that are coming over from the immune system to clean up this mess. And you know what? That's too close for that tumor. That tumor says, hey, there's immune cells over here. We can't have them getting too close because then they're going to find out what we're doing and they might start to attack us. So it sends out these hormones again, the tumor-derived soluble factors, and it says, uh, well, basically it impairs the function of the, the macrophage. If there was a janitor, if you can picture a janitor with his mop, those hormones come and break the mop in half, okay? And pull the fibers out of the mop. And now the macrophage is thinking, well, how am I going to clean this up? I guess I got to get on my hands and knees and do it. And it's still trying to work. It's trying to work. But you know what? There's regulatory oversight involved here. And the uh, more prominent immune cells say, hey, we're still getting some problem uh, molecules, some problem proteins, some antigenic uh, proteins uh, at this point. 
that are floating around the body, indicating necrotic tissue, indicating issues down there, that the macrophages, they're not doing their job, they're not working correctly, we're going to have to send in the army. You know what the army is? It's the B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, helper T cells. They're going to wage full out war against this mass of destructive tissue here. But they're not waging war against the tumor. They're waging war against the innocent uh, cells that have been, you know, the necrotic tissue? That's the innocent, that's the, the, the fragments of the cells that have been destroyed. So what does that mean? It means that if anyone knows anything about B lymphocytes, B lymphocytes produce antibodies. And those antibodies can stick to these proteins that are floating around the body. And it tells the immune system, there's the enemy. Go, go attack it. Go attack this. Go attack that. This one over here. What happens then is we have antibodies being produced to the fragments. They could be DNA fragments. Could be cellular proteins. Fragments of its own body. Now the immune system is not fighting the enemy, it's fighting it, its own body, okay? Autoimmune condition, full-blown autoimmune condition resulting from these later stages of cancer. And you know what? All was supposed to be harmony in the body, but now we have someone who is sowing discord among brethren. Brothers and sisters, do you see this? And we see, we've seen that just as it is in the spiritual, it is in the physical, isn't it? But you know the most amazing thing about all this is? Check this out. What the immune system is now fighting is the very instruction, DNA fragments, the very instruction, the very law of God. Outright war against the law of God of God. And that's what got Satan thrown out of heaven. But you know what? God wants to throw that cancer out of your body. You know that? He wants to throw it out. And I hope that many of you are amazed by this, because when I first saw it, and I'll tell you, I didn't come up with this on my own. There were people that were brought into my office like one after another, there were students that made comments that day that I was putting this presentation together about cancer. One right after the other, in my personal devotions, I, I came upon a study that was dealing with autoimmunity and cancer, a brand new study. And I was like, one after the other, everything lined up. And I said, praise the Lord, we can understand cancer. And I believe we can understand anything God wants us to understand by looking at biblical principle. Because God word, God's word un, unlocks what seems to be impossibilities in this world. I wish I had known this 15 years ago. Because my cousin went through round after round of treatments, operations, at the same time getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And eventually the day came that he passed away. But you know what? I'll tell you what. God is still merciful, isn't he? And God still used the testimony of a young man who had to leave the Marines because of a brain tumor, because of cancer, that actually changed the direction of, a, I would say, a whole town in North Carolina. Why? Because he insisted, even when he was at his sickest, even when he was enfeebled by the remedies that he had chosen to use, the chemo and whatnot, he decided he was going to church no matter what. Amen. And I think I'm going to be able one day to run with even more vigor Amen. if faithful again, with my cousin Timothy. And I'll tell you what, God doesn't always heal us the way we expect Him to heal us. But one thing we know, 
whether it be cancer or any other malady that we face, He will bring us close to Him and He will bring us home if we are willing. Is that your desire tonight? Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we can see, even through the study of nature, even through the study of our own bodies, your goodness and your forbearance. We can see your law revealed. We can see what transgression leads to. And we pray that you would give us a heart that yearns after you, that yearns after your commandments, but most of all, that yearns after the power that we don't have in and of ourselves. We know that if left unto itself, this cancer, wherever it may be found, will lead to death. But by your strength, by the power of your Holy Spirit directing the armies of the body, and by your power of the Holy Spirit directing our minds, and by your power directing the armies of heaven, cancer and sin will be forever abolished. We thank you. We ask for even this victory tonight in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.